Right, so uh, we are still working on section D, which is the only part of the syllabus I promise to give a live lecture on because it's actually the most important part of your syllabus and because it's the substantive testing, which I believe if you are not comfortable with, you will always struggle to pass AA, right? And I've tried to assist with that. Yeah, and we've done a couple of uh, work on general understanding of what this is all about. And we're at the point where we are picking each balance one after the other to take care of it and solve questions. So we've done PPE. Yeah, I've gone through the understanding of the process and we have done all possible questions that the examiners can give you on PPE. We finished that in the last session. Yeah, so by now, I believe you are able to test PPE in exams, regardless of what they are bringing, whether it's addition, whether it's disposal, whether it's depreciation, whether it's the PP as a whole on itself, you know how they can come and I'm sure you are very comfortable with it. And just to give you a bit of reminder as well, anytime you are asked to come up with procedures, I told you, you must always think of assertion first. When you think of assertions, then your work is easy because your procedures must come from the assertion you are trying to address. When you think of assertion, you will likely be able to come up with the right procedure. And what are those assertions? We said it depends on the balance, if it's a PLL item or is a statement of financial position item. If it's PLL item, you are looking at cutoff, occurrence, uh, accuracy, completeness, P and D. Yeah. And more like that. And if it's SFP, you are thinking of rights or obligation, you are thinking of existence, accuracy and valuation, your complaints is also there. P and D is very important. Likewise, classification for both of them as well. Yeah. So these are assertions that should be driving your procedures. If you don't think of assertions, you will be struggle. You'll be struggling all the time to come up with adequate procedures. Yeah, but if you're able to think of assertions, then you can say, how do I address rights? How do I address existence? How do I address accuracy and valuation? How do I address completeness? P and D, what do I have to do? Classification, what do I have to do? So by the time you think like that, you have a lot of procedures already. Yeah. So that same approach we'll keep using. Now we've done PPE. Today I want us to finish all other assets that you are expected to know for your syllabus. So hopefully we can do that today such that the next class will be just questions, exam questions for those assets. So remember, I've warned you, don't memorize procedures. It does not work like that because if you memorize procedures, you'll be given procedures for wrong questions. But when you understand your substantive testing, where the question comes, you know the right procedures to give. Right? And that's why you understand it starts from the balance, not even the audit. That is why your audits always start from planning. And the key standard there is ISA 315. That requires you to do risk assessment through the understanding of your entity and its environment. You cannot audit what you don't understand. So you must understand every balance you want to audit. Now we're done with PPE. The other asset that I need us to do now is the intangible non-current asset. So think about this, intangible non-current asset. If there's a question on intangible non-current asset, if you don't even understand what is this all about, how will you be able to come up with the right procedure? And that's why sometimes I also kind of advise students to have taken FR for doing effort, or you do both FR and AA together. You do them together so that you are learning the standards and you are doing the audit, right? Or you have done the, audit, the reporting and you are doing the audit. But don't ever try to do audit before FR. It's not advisable except you are an auditor. You have been practicing before, yeah. But it doesn't mean that you cannot pass, but just mean that you need to do more work, right? Okay, so the first thing is to understand this balance. So what is this balance? If you don't understand it, like I said, you cannot audit it. What is this talking about? What are intangible assets? Intangible non-current assets. Those are your non-current assets that you cannot touch, that doesn't have any physical substance. 
The first one we dealt with is PPE. That is a tangible non-current asset because that is property, is equipment, is land. You can touch it. But there is a non-current asset that can also be intangible, which means they don't have physical substance. We cannot touch them. An example of such is things like your brand, copyright, research and development. All of this, they are intangible assets. And our major focus actually is on this guy. This is where questions usually come from, the research and development. And do you know why? Because this brand and copyright, the rule in IS 38 for guys that don't FR or don't FR is that internally generated intangible should never be recognized. Internally generated intangible must not be recognized. And what does that mean? Brand is internally generated, copyright internally generated. You cannot recognize it. So usually, you don't have so many questions to test on that. Yeah, if they are going to ask, it's just simple. Understand that you have to know is this. So you are not expecting your client to have brand or copyright in his balance, except it got them from business acquisition. In that case, it's an externally generated, and that would have been part of goodwill. Right. So. There's nothing to worry about in that space. There's not so much to test. Where they always test you is R&D. Like I always say, guys, if you have any questions, please feel free, stop me and ask your questions. All of you have access to your microphone so you can speak. So if you think I'm going too fast or you have a question, like I said, please stop me and ask. Don't, don't raise up your hand because I might not see it. Yeah, just to remind you. Right. So the popular part is always R&D, research and development. And the general rule is in IS-38. And what does this guy, what does he want us to do? How does he want us to treat R&D? Generally, IS-38 believes that all such expenditure must be expensed. Expensed. So which means they are not an asset. They should not be capitalized. Except, except you can see now when they can be capitalized, certain conditions are met. You can see that we have not started auditing. We are just going through understanding. And that is the process of auditing. You cannot pass audit paper or even do a proper audit work without understanding. Because it's your understanding that you want to go and check. Right? So as the test says that expenditure, such expenditure, R and D, must be expensed, except certain conditions are met. And what does that tell you? It means that you must know those conditions. So what are these conditions? Three major ones you must know, and which your testing will be based on, is the fact that if such developmental costs will be capitalized, your clients must be able to demonstrate that the expenditure or the development will generate. Future economic benefits. And what does that mean? Take, for instance, you have a company that is saying, we're going into research and develop, development to see how people can fly from Netherlands to the UK without using any object, which means they, need, they can carry their own body themselves. And just by jumping up, in Netherlands, they land in London. That's the research and development work that they are doing. Whatever they incur on those work, 
the most expensive, except these three conditions are met. And the first one is that, would they be able to generate economic benefits? Yeah, and what you are saying is that, would they be able to make money from it? Will people buy it? Will people subscribe to those kind of services? We need to test it. So we need to find out, except the client can prove that people will buy it. People will not be afraid to say, what kind of magic is that? How can someone disappear in Netherlands and appear in the UK? Probably they'll be afraid, we don't know, but that is number one thing. So but if people will be happy to pay for it, then that means there will be economic benefit that will come from such research uh, and development activities. The second one is the most able to demonstrate that it is technically feasible. Which means that they must be able to actually explain to us that it is possible that someone can actually disappear or jump up in Netherlands and appear in the UK. And how will you find out? There must have been a testing before they start producing and start developing the service in a commercial country. So we will have to see the prototype. We will have to see the testing that has been done, how they have seen that it is possible. They must have done a test sample, right? That is number two condition. And the third one is that the company has the financial resources to complete the project. So I'll call it financially feasible. Which means that the company has the money to, to complete the project because if they don't have enough resources to complete it, then they cannot even make any money from it because they cannot finish it. Yeah, and how do we know that they have money to finish it? We need to check their budget. We need to speak to the board of directors or check the board of directors minutes of meetings and see where they have done all those discussions. So these are the things we'll be looking for when you are asked to test R&D. Your main thing will be these three items. That is what you'll be looking for. These three things, future economic benefits, technical feasibility and financial feasibility. When those three things are met, then you can recognize an asset. And that is when existence as an assertion has been passed. That's how you get comfort on existence, by looking at these three conditions. Right, so that is number one major thing that must be tested, right. Then, obviously, you need to think of accuracy and valuation. And at this point, your work is easier because now what you are now looking at is measurement. And when you are talking of measurement, you are talking about checking the amounts. Yeah? Because the amount is not a problem. You can have 30, and that 30 is meant to be expense and not an asset. Whether it's an asset, that is what the existence is checking. Should it be an asset? And should it be an asset is tied to these three conditions, not some of them. All these three conditions must be met. Yeah. And when it's true that it exists, then you can now go for measurement. And how do you check for measurement? There you'll be checking for the invoices that they used to pay, that they pay the people that are working, the consultant that are working on the project, or the timesheet of the staff working on the project, you know, or they spend money on something, there will be invoices, there will be contracts. So this is where you start checking the document and be confirming that the amount they have recorded is the same as the amount that they have paid. So, and that is accuracy and valuation that you are checking. And likewise, your existence, the similar approach, you, the similar testing for existence will also qualify for rights. So most times, like I said in last class, when you are able to prove existence, somehow you might be able to also prove right together with the same procedure, right? Because when all these three exist, then also there will be right. The other part is when you also check some agreements, you might be able to test for, for right. But like I said, we're going to test, we're going to look at exam questions to do the practice questions and all of that. But I need you to understand the process first before we go into the questions. Right. 
And um, because this particular asset is similar to PP, the only thing is it is not tangible, it is intangible. So, which means that the closing balance always starts from the opening balance. Just like PP, you will have additions if there is any, yeah, which we normally have as PP as well. But instead of depreciation, we don't call it depreciation here, call it amortization. It's the same thing. It's just the amortization is the correct word for intangible, while depreciation is the correct word for tangible asset, which is PP. So equals to opening plus additions minus amortization. Yeah, usually you don't do disposal for this one. And um, if there's a disposal, you can put it there, but very unlikely. And all of that give you your closing balance of intangible asset. So which means the same way you test depreciation is the same approach for amortization, which means you are checking appropriateness of policy and accuracy of the figure of the amount. Similar approach, right? Disposal is where you are looking for the approval and you are making sure that they've taken out of the group of the book. Additions, you are looking for the invoices, yeah, for the purchases. Opening balance, you are checking it against the audited prior financial statement. And the closing balance, you can test for existence, like I tell, said earlier. So that is the understanding you need to have about intangible non coin asset. All the testings, all the procedures will be coming out from this understanding, checking each of these conditions and checking invoices for increases and valuation. That is it for that.